Hello and welcome to another edition of Razorwire. Now today we're going to be talking about all things running a business within InfoSec. The pitfalls, the problems, the concerns, the issues, what it's like to run a business. Um, and to help me go through that, uh, I have brought in an absolute legend within the InfoSec community, Jane Franklin. And today, to discuss the wonders and horrors of running a cybersecurity business, who else could I have but Jane Franklin come and have a chat with me about this? She's built businesses, she's sold businesses, she's got involved in all kinds of facets of life in the cybersecurity world. And the thing that really sparked this off for me was a fantastic post she did at the end of April on outlining some of the fun and some of the some of the stuff that you need to know about running a business. So, Jane, hello. hello. Please feel free to, to to introduce yourself to the people out there. My gosh. Uh, yeah, look, I'm an entrepreneur. I mean, I've got two ways to introduce myself. You know, one it, one is like I write and speak about things that interest me, you know, which which are mostly cybersecurity, tech, and um, dogs, <laughs> the planet, the environment, sustainability and things like that. Um, or the other, the other way is kind of like I'm, I've been in cybersecurity for over 26 years. I started in cyber by building my own pen testing company back in the 1990s. I've done some executive roles. The last one was a, as a managing director at, at Accenture. And I uh, am regarded as, and, and work as an influencer in, in the industry. So, yeah, I do, I do a number of things. And then I've got all of the work that I do in regard to women, you know, that I've been doing since, you know, writing my first book, my first best-selling book in, in security. So I've put about, I think it's 419 women through my insecurity scholarships, which is, I think it's a value of about eight hundred thousand US dollars. So I'm mm. I'm pretty pretty proud of the you know the life changing experiences that those scholarships have have resulted in. So yeah, I'm a bit of an anomaly. I sit between two worlds, you know, both the kind of vendor supplier world and then also in the kind of CISO CISO world because I'm out there speaking on on panels largely with them and. In some cases, they re they regard me as a bit of a therapist to <laughs> them, a confidant. You know, the secrets that I hold, you know, are extremely precious. But you know, that's kind of who I am. And I mean, you're a legend, to be honest. I mean, you're you're all over LinkedIn. I've known about you for many, many years, from when you were actually kind of like running uh, that pen testing company. And you know, as we were saying, kind of just before we sort of hit the record button starting a business way back kind of in the 90s yeah. um, is is a very different animal from today. I mean, there's a, still a lot of commonalities, I'm guessing, you know, and you laid out some of those fantastically in your post, things like, you know, uh, cash flow and how tough it can be kind of just being the managing director. Because, I mean, I get asked this question quite a bit, you know, usually via DM over LinkedIn, you know, I, I want to start my own cybersecurity business. You've been running Razorthorn now for 17 years. Is there any sort of tips you can give me? And weirdly enough, most of the tips that I give them are pretty much what you wrote in that post. And I say to all of them, you know, don't think being the managing director or the CEO or whatever leader term you're going to put in is easy. If you think you're going to sit in an office and just delegate out loads and loads of tasks all day long, thinking, brilliant, I can sit back and read a book, uh, look out the window um, and chill out. You do get those moments, very few and far between, but it's also a lot of extra hours you put in and, you know, something suddenly kicks off and in the middle of the night you get a call or a client suddenly goes under owing you a load of money. Um, you know, that you're never going to get paid. I mean, what was it like in the 90s? Because that was the, the the dot com boom and bust. And I'm guessing you experienced yeah. Yeah. all of that stuff all at the same time, especially during that bust moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, to begin with, it was, I remember my business partner saying to me, you know what you're getting yourself into, don't you? And look, I was in my 20s, so was he. And I was like nodding, going, yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I know, I'm fully aware. <laughs> it's like no one can prepare you at all. And I mean, security then was really new. So it was, mm. it, it was in some ways, I think, easier. In some ways, easier because, because it was emerging and there were fewer companies to compete with. So what, what we did, you know, I, I recognized very early that the key to doing, uh, doing well and being successful was niching down. So literally mm. after about, I think it was after about five years of, of still leading with information security, as we called it then, or IT security, um, but also selling high value high availability servers and, and networking kit and doing all of that, the software and the implementation and so on. We, we niched down and went for pen testing. And mm. one of the, and we were one of the very few, I mean, literally there were probably about half a dozen pen testers, you know, at that time, you know, so it was, it was easy to become very well known and, and, and that, and, and it was good to specialize, you know, because it just made the job easier. And also to kind of go after buyers who really understood the value between the suppliers. You know, so for, for us as a pen testing company, we, you know, we only kind of targeted um, buyers who, who were kind of operating with huge risk. You know, so it was banks, it was retailers, it was gambling companies, it was insurers. Um, so top, top companies like that. So I think it was a lot easier, but you know, some of the things that we got caught out by was in those days was definitely like cash, cash flow. You know, so during the, when the dot com boom bubble hit and that the effects of that kind of went on for a few years, you know, some of our clients were taken out overnight, which meant that yeah. had an effect on us. You know, so we were left all without, you know, without funds because they'd, they'd mm. gone under, which affected us. So it was just the kind of like domino effect of, of, of that business. And irrespective of the dot-com boom bubble, what it goes on today, you know, clients can go under, clients can pay late, clients, and we were talking about this before, typically the larger clients will have lengthy um, terms, you know, commercial terms, payment terms. So you are literally flying by the seats of your pants, you know, and navigating navigating your company, you know, at the helm, um, which is very, very stressful, very stressful. And yes, it is exciting and it is fun, but it's also really stressful and, and it's highly, it's highly pressurized, you know, because you've got people to pay, you've got all of the, um, all of the trials and tribulations of managing staff, you know, meeting their needs, dealing with their squabbles, you know, people leaving, people joining. All of all of that stuff. It's it's really it's it's fun, but it's also really unpleasant at times. Absolutely. I mean, in the early days, you have very few clients, and you're worrying about whether or not you've got yeah. enough to keep things running. And then later on, once you develop a good good batch of clients, um, you're worried about whether or not you can facilitate all of the work. You know, growth, for instance, is a, a, a and growing the company is. You know, you would imagine it to be kind of like a solid kind of curve that goes up as you kind of build up the business, but it's not quite like that. You know, one minute you'll you'll be pootling along and you think, ah, oh, you know, I need to get a couple more pen testers, maybe one or two more pen testers, and then the sales director will come wandering over to you and say, hi, I've just won this massive, like yes. you know, five hundred prepaid day pen testing. Deal and you're like, oh, great, that's fantastic. How the hell are we going to deal with yeah. that right now? Yeah. I better go out and get those pen testers. And then the recruitment agents come running down. Oh, my fuck. This is why I keep my phone on silent a lot. There's constant flows of people trying to call me and trying to sell me people, people trying to sell me databases, yeah. people trying to sell me insurance. Um, and it can and, and the learning curve, as you say, when you're running a business, you get into it and you think, oh, this will be fun. I, I know that there'll be some challenges. Holy shit. I mean, it's like walk, it's like climbing up a vertical cliff in the first two, three yeah. years. Um, 
and and that's assuming HMRC don't you know if you're looking at this from from obviously the states it's the IRS for you guys assuming that no mistakes are made at that level which happens alarmingly regularly <laughs> well this is that or you've got an accountant who's not doing their job properly you know yeah. and then they've left you you know in 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 the crap haven't they you know i mean I, I absolutely cool you know and you, you're picking up the pieces you know you think someone's doing a, a job and then you start to kind of question it's just like well actually i'm not kind of like i'm not buying that or you know your your um the auditing company like contacts you and raises you know a, a kind of question and it and it it um well asks the question and it raises alarm bells Absolutely, yeah. You know, and it's it's it, it is it is a crazy kind of setup to have. I mean, the politics as well of, of with, with involved with recruiting people. Yes, and I mean, we have a wonderful team here. But like any group of people who work together, like a family, and you know, you go through the good times, you go through the bad times, you go through the breakups, you go through sort yeah. of like you know the wins and the weddings and the babies being born and you know, the all kinds of facets of life. And, and you do have to dance the politics dance. I mean, I started Razorthorn and I said, right, I'm not doing politics. I'm not doing politics internally. Like a naive idiot. Um, and it was all fine when it was just me and like one or two other people. Um, but the moment you got to 10, suddenly yeah. somebody dislikes somebody else. Both are good workers, both are good employees. And you're trying desperately to hold them away from one another in case something kicks off. And then inevitably, you know, you get if you get enough conflict, one of them will leave. And you're like, well, I don't want any of you to leave. You're really good at what you do. So true. So true. You know, I mean, in the 90s, you know, at the sort of beginning of this kind of internet boom, um, you know, what was the kind of key thing? Because you must have had a real problem recruiting pen testers back then. I mean, nowadays, it still can be tough. You can find a lot of not-so-good ones. But you operated at a time when a pen testing was a new thing. You know, it wasn't exactly... Yeah. You couldn't just go to a recruitment agent and say, can I have a pen tester? They'd probably think you were talking dirty. Um, you know, <laughs> what's a pen tester? What are they meant to do? You know, I get that in the pub sometimes with people who are not in InfoSec. Um, but what was it like kind of trying to get that, the, those staff back then? Um, it was easy. It was easy. Because, really? Yeah. Yeah, it was easy because, I mean, one, my company was already, it, we were elite. We were one of the best in the world and we were very well known. And we gave our, we were very forward thinking. So we gave our consultants, we gave them research time when no other company was giving research time. 25% of their time was research time. No other pencils and company did that at the time and we also allowed consultants to work wherever they wanted to in the world now no other company was doing that we were the first to do both both of those things and um and what happens is they've got friends so this group of people you need you need one and then they know another and they might be working somewhere else but they're unhappy because their environment isn't fun you know then they might not be being paid for market rate the environment isn't great so it's, it was very easy for us. And we had a pipeline of consultants, pen testers, you know, waiting to join us. And we only, we only recruited like high, you know, top um, principal consultants, you know, so we didn't take on any juniors apart from one time when I was, I was sent uh, a CV of someone and um, I, and then this guy, well, he'd done his like um, thesis. He was a graduate, and he'd done his thesis on on my company. And he was a really nice covering letter. And I said to my business partner, "Oh, you know, I think this guy. You know, we don't we don't take on juniors, but I really think we should look at this guy. You know, he looks really interesting. Mm. He's at the start of his career, but he looks like he's got good good experience. If if nothing more, please can you give him a call and have a chat with him? And mm. um, and so we did that, and he came and worked for us. And we got him shadowing our our consultants and taught him taught him how to how to be a pen tester. And he learned very, very quickly. And um, you know, he's now at the top of his game, you know, ahead of a director, you know, certainly last time of uh, working at one of the big brand companies. I I, I 
I'm not up to date with where he's working now, but, you know, he was absolutely fantastic. So he learned very, very quickly and was a real, real asset. But yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a problem for us because, because of the environment, because we had, you know, a group of consultants who knew other consultants just like them who were unhappy working where they were. What about salespeople? Well, salespeople, oh, look, that's always that's always a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, the vast majority of salespeople are are crap. You know, they really are, and they literally move around from company to company, usually being crap and then earning more money. So um, <laughs> it's very, it's really rare you get a performing salesperson. You can get a lot of average salespeople, and and that's okay, you know, because it's they're, they're bringing in money and they're they make new money. You also get a lot of, of really poor performing salespeople that you have to fire really, really quickly. You know, so yeah. again, with experience, you know, you, you um, can tend to spot them, you know, more uh, faster and, and, and let them go faster. So for, uh, certainly for, for me working with, <laughs> with salespeople, I look for certain characteristics. I like to bring on salespeople who are who are more new to the industry actually they're hungry you know they're 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 hungry they need to make money they want to make money and they've got a drive and they're extremely competitive and their values align align with with my and my company's values so you know i've tried over the years i've tried lots of different things i've i've recruited older people experienced people and there is merit to doing that um, for certain roles. You know, if you want a commercial director, you know, or a, a chief commercial director or a director or even a manager, then you want someone who's got more experience. And sometimes you can bring in, say, a manager who's not actually that great a salesperson but can actually really manage a team uh, of salespeople uh, and bring them on really nicely and get them, get them performing. So you've really got to look at, the skills that are involved and the, the values, I think, of the people that you're, you're bringing into the team. And uh, do they have the traits that you're looking for? Which is, you know, they're not, for me, if I've got someone who's squir- squirreling away money, then, you know, they, you know, that, that's a smart thing to do. But I want someone who's going to burn through money because they need to earn money. You know, so yeah. it's just like, desperation. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, somebody needs a lot of money so that they will perform and make it because that's that's a a, a route a route out of the situation that they're in. Absolutely. I mean, moving back to to kind of like you know what it's like to run a business. I don't know about yourself, but for me, I think one of the things that I've learned very quickly um, was um, you know I'm not just looking after my own organizations, finances, and all the rest of it. But I also feel a level of responsibility to all the families of the people yes. who I employ. You know, and I, I was I was describing this to um, uh, my my missus's sort of brother and sister-in-law um, a while back. And then they were saying, you know, what's it like? And I said, the, one of the hardest things is realizing that there's, you know, in my case, 18, 19 families that Razor Thorn is responsible for. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, we've got to get their pay in on time. We've got to get commissions paid. We've got to get bonuses paid. We've got to, you know, there are kids involved. Obviously, you know, a lot of people have children. So, you know, it, it, you're responsible to a certain extent. I mean, everybody's responsible for themselves, you know, but being at the top, that level of, of, of realization is pretty brutal on the psyche especially when things are tough. Is that something that you experienced? I mean, you know, I'm the sole, I'm the sole director, so I don't have anyone to bounce off. You know, I don't have a, a business partner anymore, you know, and, and so everything yeah. rests on me. And one of the, the wonderful things that you mentioned in your post was about mentors and coaches in the business world. Um, and that's what you do a lot of these days. You, co- you coach a lot of people coming in. 
what are you seeing from those in new incoming kind of people that you're mentoring? Is it the same kind of concerns? Or do, do they get that realization? Oh crap! I'm suddenly responsible for all these people. Yes, but I think it's it can be quite gradual. So you know, it's it's you know, it, it's like taking the baby steps, isn't it? It's just like oh, okay, you know. So it kind of scales. So, um. You know, I think that, that the hardest part for someone kind of starting a business is right in the very beginning, because I think that's when it, it kind of hits. And there are, there are several points, but I think right at the very beginning is when it kind of hits them and they kind of go, Shit, what have I done? You know, like, oh my God, this is quite overwhelming. And they've got um, their, their family and friends who might be kind of saying to them, well, you know, how are you doing? Where's the business? Um Oh, you know, I don't think you should have done it or I think you should have done it this way. So they're all kind of, you know, plowing in and, and giving their, their view on, on the situation and doubting. And that can be really, really hard to manage. And you need, you need strength to be able to deal with that. And you also need people on your side who are kind of like supporting you. And that's where, that's where definitely mentors and coaches can come in and they can say, look, this happens and this is how to hand, this is how to handle it. And you are going to need to be strong and you are going to have to go out and, and work your butt off and, and prove some, prove some wrong. There's that old kind of like saying, you know, it's lonely at the top. Yes. Oh God, is it lonely? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're carrying, it's like you're carrying a heavy sack, aren't you? It's on your shoulders. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you can take, you can take that off. You, I think you have to mentally do that. I mean, we, you said you decompress, you know, before going home, you know, particularly if, you know, a bad day at work, you know, just to do that. You know, for me, I, I'll, um, I'll usually walk, walk with my dog. You know, I live in the countryside, so I'll, I'll, I'll get out and I will decompress that way. And, uh, and that helps me think, it helps me think creatively, solve problems, you know, without kind of going out and going, oh, I'm going to solve a problem whilst I'm walking my dog. I don't, I just go out, walk my dog and, and have some, some air time, you know, but, You've got to find a way and definitely coaches and mentors, some friends, some family can be your absolute champions. It can be really supportive and, and really useful, but a lot of the time they can't. And this is why it's really important for you to have that strength and have that courage and have that conviction and also be able to effectively, I think, pitch to them and to be able to, to communicate and say, look, you know, I need you to be like this. You know, I need to have my back. I need your support. You know what you're doing is is not helpful at all to me because it consumes my energy because I'm I'm then having to kind of work extra hard you know when I come home or when it's my you know my downtime to get to get you on board when you're doubting me you have enough doubts anyway you know kind of as you know at, at moments not like permanently otherwise you wouldn't be doing it and you won't be successful but every now and again you will doubt it and you'll go what have i done <laughs> I'm go, I'm, yes i'm gonna jack this in i think it's time to get a job you know so, so you have you know the those little kind of demons or voices that you will hear every now and again and sometimes i don't know about you jim but sometimes you know i'll have those times where i'll go i'm done that's it game over yeah and like not doing this anymore you know, I'm just going to do this, and and that's it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, point fourteen on your on your post was the emotional roller coaster, and it's absolutely right. You know, and you can have phenomenal highs, and you can have phenomenal lows, and it can happen instant. There's an instant yeah. switch. Yeah. You could be down. You could be down on your ass with your last five pounds in the bank account. And going, oh, what am I going to do? You know, we've got all these people working. I've we've got fiver in the bank account. We're owed, you know, nearly a million quid, and people are, are being slow on paying. Um, and then all of a sudden, boom! You'll suddenly find three of the customers are paid. Everything's much better than, and you're like, oh my god, thank god! You know, I mean, when I, when I started racing, I had hair, and I was I, I wasn't grey anywhere near as grey as I am now. And I look at pictures of myself. Um, so, because I started Razor Thorn back in sort of 2007, 2008, when, um, you know, the financial crisis had hit. And if you ever want to learn about that out there, watch the big short, yes. really good film, kind of goes through 
roughly what happened from a, a lot of different perspectives. And I'd been made redundant from the newspaper that I was kind of heading the security for at the time. Um, and like all good Brits, I went straight down the pub after I'd been made redundant and had a pint by the river, by, by the River Thames. Um, and I'm like, right, what am I going to do? And I thought, you know what, I'm going to start a consultancy and I'm going to do it better. I'm not going to do it because a lot of the consultancies I'd worked with them for, and if you're still out there watching this, any of my ex-bosses, sorry, I'm going to say a few things. Um, yeah, but they were run predominantly by salespeople and accountants and yeah. kind of money people. So their focus was very much on money and the balance sheets and so on and so forth. Um, and I thought I would do it the other way around. I did it from a consulting perspective, you know, look after the customers and they'll come back. And it's worked really, really well for us. Um, but, you know, you kind of go into starting this business with this bright, bright sun, you know, behind you in a field of green. And then you get your first HMRC bill and you realize that there's a bull in there, in that field with you, and you're about to get steamrolled by this damn thing. Um, and then, you know, it keeps coming and it won't go away. Um, and yeah, it, it can, you, you get the phenomenal highs when things start working really well, and then you get phenomenal lows. And one of the things that I learned really early on, um, and it sounds stupid, but you forget this when you're, when you're in the, you know, doing this, is to have your plan and stick to it. Get your business plan sorted. At least a goal that you're heading towards. Um, it could be monetary, it could be from a size perspective, you know, but but follow that 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 business plan that you have and beware of your first growth period. Because the first growth period when it's, you know, I'm not talking about when it's, you know, you get your first employee, but when you say you got about five or six, they'll reach a point where you'll need to expand and it won't be one person you need, it'll be more like three or four. Um, and that's the risky bit. And I was warned this by my own accountant. He was a—he's retired now, but he was a wonderful accountant, and he'd been running his accounting business for many, many years. You know, the grizzled old business person. Um, and he said, "When you hit that, watch out. You know, don't go too fast. If you go too fast, you'll kill your business in seconds. Because the moment you get those people on board, and you see that wage bill pop up for the next month, um, you won't have had time to build up." additional clients to be able to pay for that expansion. And he's right. And it gets harder as well. Every time we've expanded, it's it's a big risk. But, you know, you go through a, f a couple of months of pain and restabilizing. And then hopefully if you've done it right, you're fine and you can move forward. Is that your experience as well? Or is that just me? No, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, it's just like when you're five, six people, it, it, it's like you're so small particularly if you're working in an office, um, it's like your family. You all have a great time. You know, it's fun. And then you start to kind of grow and new types of people come in and, you know, other people might feel that their noses have been, like, pushed out a little bit, you know. So, you know, it, it, it can be really tricky, tricky like that. I mean, what I did with my business was um, when we started, when we started to see, like, patterns of growth and acquire clients, Oh, we had an associate pool or consultants or pen testers um, available. So we would ease that pain and ensure that we had that consistent growth by using associates. And then once, yeah. once we kind of were sure of that, and it was more expensive, but it was less risky. You know, so then once we had that confirmation that, yeah, that was quite stable, then we would look to take on, you know, a consultant. I don't think we ever took on numerous consultants at the same time, but maybe maybe we did. We might have taken on salespeople and pen testers. Um, you know, it could even have been like that and and replacing an accountant. But mm. a lot of as much as possible, what we would try and do would be to to outsource, you know, our non core things. So accountancy like outsource. Um telling Tony sales, Tony market outsourced. You know, you kept the cost quite consistent and there were no kind of like surprises. <clears throat> and we could turn that on and off, you know, if, if we wanted to. And so it was easier to scale. But certainly when we were growing and growing um, our pin testing and, and uh, consultant side of things, we would ease that pain by having associates. 
Yeah, I mean, we've we did the same thing back in the day, you know, and and now we've got quite a decent pool of pen testing um, into internal pen testing people. We don't need it so much, but we do keep a few of the really good ones that we know very well who've been really good with us. You know, if you're watching this, hello guys. <laughs> um, they're they're great people, and we pull them in from time to time to 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 help out with bigger projects and that kind of stuff, and they love it, and we love them as well. And and I found a lot of the really kind of high end pen testers have gone freelance now really because they've, they've learned they can earn quite a bit more and it's not just us that use them they're, they're like used by about three or four different pen testing companies and they, they they're they just happy in their life just yeah. kind of wandering along I mean that can be difficult sometimes from a client perspective with, with commercials you know so because sometimes there can be a requirement that you can't use um, non-permanent members of, of staff you know, which I, I don't know if that still still goes on now or if it's any easier because we've got more marketplaces for kind of procuring um, consultants on a basis. It is easier now um, because I think everybody's experienced that. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of cloud, crowdsourced pen testing companies now, which drive me up the pole because they don't do, and I'm sorry, I'm going to criticize the market here, I'm going to get shot. Um, they don't necessarily validate the credentials of the people that they're bringing on board. There's a lot from Eastern Europe, there's a lot from the Philippines and all the rest of it. And I'm sure they're really, really good people. But, you know, a lot of our customers turn around and say, well, I don't want, you know, anybody from, from that region like some of the other companies do. Um, because, you know, there's no there's no guarantee that, that they're not going to just find a vulnerability, not report it, and then sell it to an access broker or whatever on the dark web because they earn more money doing that, you know. Yeah. So it's, I think, you know, something you mentioned earlier on, the, the market is very saturated, but mm -hmm. I think definitely one of the things that I, I learned a really big lesson on early, early on is diversification of revenue streams. This was the big one for me, you know, because in the early days we did consultancy. That's all we did, you know. Um, then we kind of branched into pen testing. Um, but we went through a period where for some reason, you know, other than the PCI stuff we were doing, because we had a lot of good PCI customers, the consultancy just kind of dropped off the map. I, you know, nobody wanted ISO. It was just, it was just a bit of a, a blip in the market for about eight months or so. So we suddenly saw the revenue on our consulting side just drop quite significantly. Um, and the pen testing side kind of went up. All of a sudden, everybody just wanted pen tests. It's, it's weird. It's the way the market works, you know. Um, and I learned then, you know, if we were just consulting, we would have pretty much gone out of business. You know, yeah. I would have had to at least downsize quite significantly. Um, and that's why we then sort of looked at what we were doing and what we were recommending. So, you know, we've got those these four tranches of business in Razor Thorn. Now, I'm giving all my secrets away on a bloody podcast. So we've got the, the, the consultancy, which is pretty consistent and generates lots of good work um, and generates a lot of good relationships with a lot of good people and a lot of good customers. The pen testing is a bit more commoditized maybe now than it, it was back when you were doing it. I don't know, it would be interesting to get your insight because... We can turn around a pen test now in a two or three days. Somebody comes to us and say, could I have a pen test? You do the scoping. They go, yeah, that looks good. You've got a sale. You know, maybe in the 90s it was, well, give us your credentials. We, we want to see what you can do first and so on and so forth. But then we've got like the product sales from the consultancy um, where we we get a commission, you know, but but we, we're very careful when we recommend products. So it's always three products, never just one. Vendors don't like that that often. Um, but then, you know, I've been running with that sequence for quite a while, but then lockdown hit. And oh my God, the consultancy fell off a cliff. God, see you later. You know, the PCI audits were still being done, but it was remote. You couldn't travel. You couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't see anyone. Um, and then, you, of course, you start a podcast like Razor Wire. But, you know, um, I, I suddenly saw everything fall and drop, but because everybody had been changing their environments and like, you know, everybody was going remote, putting in facilities for those remote requirements, everybody wanted pen testing. Everybody wanted it pen tested because they wanted to validate the change, big changes they'd been going through. Um, and that's what saved us. You know, I think a lot of much smaller companies died in that period because they didn't have diversification of revenue streams. So if, 
I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you've got to you've got to watch market. You know, you've got to see where it's going and, and keep your eye on, it. look for those those trends and and pivot. You know, so many. I mean, I think of, I mean, certainly my company. If I think about my pen testing company, yes, we did pivot. You know, we got caught out by the dot com boom bubble, and we were selling products um, and as well as implementing them. But there came a point where we couldn't sell we couldn't sell them. So we, we really had to go your like services and our focus was on pen testing because that's where that's where the demand was, that's where the market was, we, we had the skills and so on. So we decided to like fully commit to that. But there were still services around that that, that we did. You know, so it wasn't just, you know, hundred percent pure pen testing. You know, mm. the, like threat modeling or um, stress testing or architecture design, you know, and, and, and so on. Um, the, like, if I think of the period, um, the COVID period, you know, so many companies then had to pivot. If they hadn't mm. pivoted, they would have gone under. So, they, you know, before, you know, a, a few minutes ago, you were talking about, um, you know, cash flow and like your, your, your bank account being low. You know, and it's just like, holy shit, we've got, we've got staff to pay. You know, we've got a wages bill that is this amount and it's, it's due. It needs to go out. There are families to feed and, and so on. Mm. You know, so during that COVID period, you know, I spoke to many successful entrepreneurs who had successful businesses and, um, and helped them to pivot so that they could continue, you know, with, with their business. And thankfully they are, they have continued and they're doing really, really well. But I, I knew exactly how much money they had in their bank account because they told me and said, hell, you know, this is a situation I'm just going to go under. Um, so you've got to, you've got to have your eye on the market and know where it's going. And you've got to be able to pivot, um, when, when the time, um, is needed. So that, that's my, that's my view on it. And. The, the thing is, I think if you're serving your clients and you're listening to their problems and their challenges and really paying attention to them, then it's far easier to pivot. It's far more natural because you're going to, instead of like literally like turning like you know, fast and going, okay, here we are, we got to go there. You kind of end up moving more. It's like, okay, well, you know, this is, this is like I'm hearing, I mean, and and hearing a trend here. You've got this problem, fine. Other client, you've got this problem. My other client, you've got this problem. So it's it's more of a kind of gentle pivot rather than a, an abrupt pivot. But sometimes you need to do that abrupt pivot. I agree totally. Um, one of the ones that I I read in your list, I really liked this one. Oh, because like you know. 20, I mean, I got in 27 years ago. We've been in the, this game for about the same kind of time. Yeah. Maybe it's just a kind of recent, in the last five to 10 years, as InfoSec has become quite an important, or cyber sex, security, whatever the bloody hell you want to call it. It's, a, it's been called sexy names throughout, throughout time. IT security when I first got in, then it was information security, then it's cyber security. God knows what it's going to be next week, but... Egos. I want to talk about <laughs> egos, and and this is where we get into trouble. And we won't mention any names whatsoever. I'm definitely not going to mention any names on this one. Back when I first got in, there wasn't much in the way of ego in this industry. There was a lot of people who were experiencing a lot of difficulties, kind of convincing people to do infosec in their organisations. You know, oh, that's never happened before. Why do? Why should we worry about it? You know, let's worry about it if it happens, kind of thing. Now. Fast forward 20 odd years, people are now seeing in the media the horror of ransomware and what's going on in, in, in various different sort of businesses and how much risk these businesses are actually carrying. And I used to get fun ones like, oh, this big business should be fine for security because they're a big business. And I'd sit there and say, well, I've actually spoke to a few people in that big business. And in my, my experience, the bigger the business and the more well-known the business, the yeah. worse they do with security. Don't think just because they're a big business that they've, they've got security knuckled yeah. down. Maybe it's a time of, of, you know, influencers like us sort of coming out, but but I do speak to a few people with massive egos and I'm like, dude, ditch your ego. Nobody likes somebody with a massive ego. If you're sitting there in a room 
with a load of business people trying to convince them to purchase services from you in a, like an event or something. And you can't stop talking about how cool you are and how you can do everything. Nobody can do everything. You're not a specialist yeah. in every area. Calm it, you know, calm it down. You'd probably sell much better. What's your experience with 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 the ego business, the infosec world? What what are your thoughts on it at the moment in time? I mean, absolutely, you get the egos. I think it's really exhausting, actually, insecurity. It's so refreshing when you're mixing with people who don't have those big egos. And for me, when I when I come across the egos, it's instant like okay, insecurity, like deep rooted insecurity. There to have such a big ego means that you are so so insecure about yourself otherwise you wouldn't have such a, a, a big ego you know because you're, you're pushing it out there so you've always got to navigate you know with those with those egos and get them on side and make them feel more safe in dealing with you so sometimes you've got to pamper those egos and other times it's a case of okay well i i accept that i see that let's see if i can reduce that ego a little bit by making you feel safer and less threatened um, by interacting with me. And I think sometimes that can be easier for women to deal with um, if they're dealing with a, with a man um, than, you know, men dealing with other men. Mm. You know, it, it, I really do. And it's not, I've heard that from, from others in the industry. I remember one CISO I was speaking to when I was writing my book and he said, Women are so useful because in the banking environment, because you don't get that kind of male alpha kind of oh. going on, you know, and there you've got the egos there and it's, it, you can't get past, you can't move a project along, you know. So I think it can be, it can be really helpful from that perspective, but you know, it doesn't mean to say that women don't have egos or you don't have that situation when you're dealing, you know, with women to women. Um, because egos are around no matter you know, what gender you, I you identify by. So, yeah, it is, it is tricky. And the other thing also is like when we're talking about pen testers, a lot of the pen testers out there can be right divas. You know, they have <laughs> egos. And I think, I think they've always kind of had that. You know, so you're, you're dealing with a pen testing team and it's like, okay, you know, a, you know, a team of, of Divas, you know, of varying varying degrees. So you're having to you're having to manage that. But um, yeah, it's it, it is it is what it is. All, all I'll say is it's so nice when you're not you're not you're dealing with people who are so successful, mm. and they, and and you don't see the ego. You're not experiencing that ego, and it's just so refreshing. It really is. It's wonderful being in the company of people who don't. We don't have those big egos, and I think that's that's a that's a thing from a lot of you know us who've been around for a while. I see a lot of egos in kind of like you know an elitism kind of in that middle range of people who've been in who've, who've been reasonably successful in their career and they've hit that kind of midway through. And oh, I've worked for this company and I've worked for this name drop and name drop and name drop, and it's like guys, just calm down. You know, we're all in this together. We've all experienced the fun and the horror. And we know what the, you know, how good and how bad the industry is. Just chill out, yeah. you know. I mean, the amount of times I've gone to InfoSec and I've sat with like three or four different sort of peers, you know, people from different parts of the market. We've been around the block a few times and we're just sat there in the bar having a pint, watching kind of like people wander past, sort of like, you know, grandstanding who they are and sometimes on the vendor side of it as well, you get a lot of it there. And it's just like, guys, just chill out. You know, you'll, have, you'll be far more successful if you add a bit of humility in. Yeah. You know, because if you do become quite well known, and this goes on to point 20 that you've had, you pointed out, you know, if you find your niche and you become well known, it's important to maintain kind of that approachability. It's horrible to have somebody who is completely unapproachable or they portray that unappro you know that unapproachable kind of aspect. I mean, all it took was me, you know, dropping you a quick message and you wonderful you turn around and said, Yeah, we'll come on and 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 you know talk about that. Um, which is great. And a lot of people are like that. Um but yeah, you know, if you do sort of become well known, keep yourself open to other people, especially the youngsters coming into the industry, because they need that mentorship and they need that insight. 
I completely, I completely agree. I always try. Mm. I always try because obviously, like time, time is money. You know, you've got mm. a million and one things to do. But I always really make an effort with young people. And if they contact me on on LinkedIn and we're connected, you know, whether it's a call I do with them or whether it's a message or a you know, <clears throat> a, a direction, go here, do this, or you know, seek these people out. I'll always try and do that to with the young people. You know, one, I remember myself being young. <laughs> it's not that long ago. It's <laughs> just a joke. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I remember how difficult it was. And, and also I've got three, um, three kids, they're older kids. And my, my eldest one is, you know, graduated several years ago. He's been at work. And my other two are, you know, right at the start of their careers. So I know how difficult it, it is. And I want to help as much as I can. Of course, you know, time, you know, time is, is your master and time is money when you're running your own business. So it's, there's only a certain amount of time that you can give to people reaching out. And then what I find is, you know, I find a lot of people, you know, reaching out and asking for, can you do me a favor or can you do this or, you know, all free oh. stuff. And it's like, I can no. pick your brains and it's just like, well, you know, if I said yes to all of those things, you know, I wouldn't be able to like earn a living. You know, I've got a, mm. a, a you know, I've got bills to pay and supporting my, my kids as a sole breadwinner, you know, and, and all of that. And it's just, I don't, I don't have a problem with people asking at all. Um, and by all means, you know, do it because, you know, someone could say yes. But equally, it's just like, I can't say yes to everything. There's a finite, finite amount, you know, I, I can do. So, well, that's where, Podcasts are helpful. That's where books are helpful. You know, when you can actually get to more people and, um, you know, with, with the one asset effectively, and it, rather than like a hundred kids coming to you and saying, what advice would you give? You know, and, and the other thing I also think is when you've got young people coming to you um, and asking for advice, it, it's like, where have you been beforehand? Have you looked at my website? And have you yeah. read my book? You know, there's an awful lot of information rather than just coming straight off and, and asking. Do a little bit of work beforehand before going to, you know, someone who has got influence or clout or been around the block a few times in the, in the industry, you know, before, before approaching them. You know, I get a lot of youngsters come to me and I did like master classes and, and helped to load out and what have you yeah. over quite a long period of time. And they now moved on into really nice sort of infosec careers. And it's, it's nice to see that. And I know full well that somewhere down the line in sort of 10 years' time, they'll crop back up and they'll be at the top of their game and they'll be like, oh, you know, you help me out, get, you help me get in, you answer my questions. Yeah. I have more, you know, just certainly when it comes to initiatives and, and charities, you know, I think it's when you're helping commercial companies out who are taking, you know, fees, you know, you know, tickets and things like that to events or whatever. I have more of a problem. It's like your commercial company who's doing pretty yeah. well. You know, you're asking me to do this for free. I think that's a bit cheeky. Obviously, like you've got that opportunity to say yes or no. But when it's a charity or an initiative, it, it, it's different. If, if, I mean, the last last bit I will say on you know, because time's moving on. I know you're a, a busy person. Um, I was reading on LinkedIn from one particular. Um, pretty well-known person in the industry. He's a lovely guy. Um, I want to get him on the channel. I will be reaching out to him. Um, and he was saying how he gets asked to speak and he, he actually put up the, the cost of going and what he, you know, and he doesn't get paid for it. And they'll probably pay for his hotel room. They'll probably pay for his flight. But obviously you've got meals, you've got all the other stuff that goes with, with doing the travel and the time away from home. I mean, you've got kind of older children, I'm guessing, at uni or kind of in uni, so it's easier to do now. But go back sort of like eight years or so, you know, eight or nine years when those children were at school and exactly. what have you. You know, you, you can't do that and you definitely can't do it for free, you know. And as you say, if it's a commercial concern, you're like, look, guys, you know, if you're a charity, I'd help you out maybe, you know to a certain extent but you know if you're a multi-million pound company why why do you think i'm going to come to talk at your event for nothing come on you know put your put your hands in your pocket <laughs> is it because you get a few drinks and you get a networking opportunity and you can like elevate your personal brand and it's like well you know 
Thanks very much. But no, thank you. Uh, you, know. you do that efficiently and effectively anyway. I mean, you've got one of the biggest brands here. I mean, we're at the end now. Thanks for the insight into kind of like, you know, your views on what it's like running a business in InfoSec and current. I mean, there's, there's so much we could talk about. Maybe we can revisit it. But I know you've got a couple of initiatives. Obviously, you, you're, you're an author yourself. You've got um, sort of books out there. Is there anything you want to kind of plug? You've got a new podcast yourself, haven't you? I have got podcasts, but it's not it's not current at the moment. So I had a podcast for Women in Cybersecurity that I did, you know, a, a few years ago. Um, at the moment, really, I'm focusing my efforts on um, influencer work. So I'm working with big brands. Um, the current one at the moment is MasterCard. Um, although I've worked with lots of others, Palo Alto, BlackBerry, um, Cisco, Citrix, Microsoft, Intel, um, you know, and, and so on. So I do a lot of work really helping companies to elevate, you know, their presence, their brand, get engagement, um, and so on. And the other thing that I'm really, um, really enjoy doing is coaching um, entrepreneurs to grow and scale their business. You know, that's, I have so much experience in that and I really love helping companies to to do better you know and yeah i absolutely love doing that work and i'm i'm, I'm pretty good at it so um that's you know those two areas um are, are places that I, I really like to focus my efforts there you go and where can we find you online if uh, somebody wants to kind of get mentorship from you on on running their business or yeah. taking their business to the next level where can they find you so jane-franklin.com so that's my website linkedin it's it's jane franklin everywhere it's jane franklin i've, I've kind of kept quite simple and and definitely do that you know even if you're looking to get into it you're considering it um jane's a lovely lady who's got a lot of experience and you know, the, it's it's always good to kind of, if you're going to get into this game, run your idea through a few people first, you know, who are in the game, you know, because, um, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting in this space uh, and it can get even more interesting even faster, especially now AI is starting to go crazy and everybody's panicking about that. So we'll see how that one goes. I'll get you back at some point and we'll talk about that with some few other people. Um, yeah. Jane, as always, absolute pleasure. Um, thank you very much. And for all of you out there watching, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us if there's any content that you want us to kind of talk over or you want me to bring a guest back and talk about something specific. I get DMs all the time on LinkedIn, people wanting to us to cover various different parts of con con uh, different, different content and so on and so forth. 90% of people don't subscribe. So please, if we could earn that subscription, it would really, really help us with the algorithm quite a bit and getting the message out. So thank you very much, guys. And again, thank you, Jane. Um, and we'll see you all again really soon. And thank you for listening or even watching the latest edition of Razorwire. It's always good to get feedback. Please feel free to reach out to us. You can reach out to us via LinkedIn or through our website, www.razorthorn.com. If you feel that there's something that we should cover maybe a little bit more in depth, a new topic or something of interest to you or the community at large, um, we'll even do interviews. If you've got any recommendations or you want us to interview people, we'll reach out to those individuals and see if we can get them on camera um, so we can ask them the important questions about info sec um, so it'd be great to see what your feedback is in addition i do have a book uh recently come out the cyber sentinels handbook a primer for information security professionals now this book is very much geared up towards professionals all levels of their career um be they starters be they newcomers be they people who've been in it for a little while and maybe looking for a little bit more direction albeit the older ones looking to maybe reground themselves in some of the more uh, important aspects of the trade that maybe they've forgotten over time. I've had lots of good feedback from a lot of different readers of a lot, lots of different levels, so please feel free to get yourselves a copy. Um, we've got the e-copy, we've also got the paperback copy, and if you don't want to spend any money, you can go on Kindle Unlimited uh, and read the book for free there as well. So thank you ever so much again. Look after yourselves and we'll be seeing you again soon.